Good afternoon and welcome to Gilchrist Museum. Thank you all for coming out today. Uh, my name is Cindy Williams. I am the Acting Director of Education here at the museum. We're very excited today to have Dr. Robert Pickering here to give us a little bit more information about our incredible exhibition, West Mexico Ritual and Identity. If you've not had the opportunity to see this exhibition, you really need to take a few minutes today after the lecture and go and visit it. It's incredibly beautiful. One person told me in person it was a stunning exhibition, so that was, I thought, a great compliment for an exhibition. Uh, Dr. Pickering is the co-curator of this uh, exhibition, along with Cheryl Smallwood-Roberts, who is also here. There you are, in the middle, right in the middle. So, so Cheryl's here too. Uh, Dr. Pickering is a professor of anthropology at TU. He's also the director of the museum's uh, science and management program at TU. And he has co-authored a beautiful book on um, West Mexico, and it's called Shack Tombs and Figures in West Mexican Society, a Reassessment. And Cheryl and he have both put together a gorgeous exhibition catalog. Both of those will be for sale uh, after the program in the museum shop, and Dr. Pickering will be doing a book signing there. So I hope you join us then. Please help me welcome Dr. Robert Pickering. I'm moving a little slow today. I hope you don't mind. Uh, well, let's go to West Mexico. This is a fascinating part of the world, uh, one which I have had the privilege to uh, work in really since I was an undergraduate at SIU Carbondale, and that was quite a long time ago. Um, but I found West and North Mexico to be just one of the most exciting and interesting places uh, that I've ever been. And in the 1990s, uh, I became very interested in the large ceramic figures from West Mexico. Have, have, who, who has been to the exhibit? So far. So you, you kind of all know what those figures look like. Uh, they're very exciting. They're very interesting. Uh, they're not as well known as you might uh, think. And one of the, the sort of challenges and, and uh, how do I want to say uh, 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 sources of paranoia uh, in putting an exhibit together is obviously to, to present this, this body of work to the general public. Um, you need to be interpretive. You need to try try to answer some general and some basic questions. And, and as an archeologist, we tend to get caught up in minutia and all that sort of thing. So when you do an exhibit and you, you say, what are the questions we wanna answer? And then in your head, the response comes back, I don't know if we have an answer to that question yet. So it really sort of is a, a sobering moment for scholars to say, you know, there's still a lot of important work to be done. And by creating an exhibit like this, it, it sort of creates a, a, what I would call sort of what I hope is the high watermark of what we know right now about this ancient culture. And so from this point on, we will hopefully uh, address some of the new questions or some of the old questions that we know we haven't been able to answer sufficiently. And we'll move on from there. So. We're going to go to West Mexico. Well, we know, you all know, uh, lots of Mexican cultures. You've heard of the Aztecs, and you've heard of the Maya, and you've heard of the Olmec, and you may have visited Teotihuacan, uh, uh, North America's most spectacular prehistoric city, bar none. Uh, those are images you may know. Those are cultures. At least you have some idea of what they are. But what about West Mexico? Where's that? Well, what we like to say is that, that uh, West Mexico is essentially from Guadalajara to the West Coast, okay? Um, environmentally, it's a very diverse region. It has, uh, it's, uh, uh, has wonderful environments from high volcanoes to uh, chains of inland lakes. Um, migratory waterfowl come through there. The ancient West Mexicans of 2,000 years ago also exploited sea resources along the, uh, along the Pacific coast. So environmentally, uh, it's pretty rich. It's, uh, it's rich in minerals and other resources as well. Bottom line, this would have been a pretty good place to live. Uh, 
And certainly by 2,000 years ago, which is the time period we're talking about for this culture, um, there was a pretty large human population. Now, one of the things I'm gonna say next may surprise you. Uh, these were agricultural people, that shouldn't be a surprise, but we often think that agriculture signifies a very high sophisticated society. And to some extent it does. It, it requires certain kinds of knowledge and practice. Um, but I would also say from an anthropological standpoint, um, the introduction of agriculture actually suggests that the ability to live as a hunter and gatherer, which provides a very rich diet in this type of environment, is no longer working. There are too many people to support by hunting and gathering, so agriculture is the response. What that means is um, people are less likely to starve to death, but they're also not getting as good a diet. And we see that represented sometimes in the skeletons of these individuals. We see the evidence should have turned my own phone off. Uh, <laughs> we sometimes see this in the evidence in the, in the bones and the teeth of these ancient skeletons, okay? Well, this is a very important culture. Uh, when you are in the exhibit, you will see one of the two great murals that, that uh, uh, we ask Herb Rowe, a uh, professional artist to create. Herb has done a number of interpretive murals at other archeological sites in the United States. He'd never done one in West Mexico. And Cheryl and I worked with Herb for a couple of months uh, based on some photographs, based on some of our figures and our observations to create, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, to create these figures, which are based on figures from the Gilcrease collection, uh, and this site map, which is uh, a representation of the Guachimonton site west of Guadalajara. This is a model of a village from the Gilcrease collection. Compare the two. Um, here we have uh, houses on platforms in a circle around a circular platform pyramid. This is the Guachimonton site with a circular platform pyramid surrounded by a circular plaza, surrounded by platforms with structures on top, and there are groups of these in the large sites, in the small farmsteads, in the small farming hamlets. It may be only one of these circles. So this is the standard architecture for West Mexico. If you've seen Tenochtitlan, if you've seen the Toltec ruins or uh, the Mayan ruins, you're familiar with this idea of stepped pyramids, but they're all square there. Well, in West Mexico, they're platforms, but they're round. What's the significance of that? Wish I could tell you. But it's different. It's definitely different. Okay, um, by 2,000 years ago, and this is probably the, the premier site, this is uh, an aerial photograph of the same site that we just saw there. Okay, um, here's the large platform complex, here's a ball court, here are other circular um, complexes uh, connected with this one. Here's another one up here. If you go to Guachimonton today, this is what you'll see. This is part of the reconstruction. In the exhibit, uh, we have on video a 3D view of the Guachimonton site that you can actually touch the screen and, and look around the site from there. Okay, um, now we talk about words. What do we call these people? What did they call themselves? Well. Truth be told, we don't know what they called themselves. This culture became extinct 1,500 years before the Aztecs came to Mexico. This is an old culture. So we don't know what they called themselves. We're not even for sure what language they spoke. We do know that by the time that the Spanish came to West Mexico after the conquest of Mexico, uh, the Tarascan Empire was, was in full bloom and power in West Mexico. The Tarascan Empire was one of the few other Mesoamerican empires that the Aztecs did not conquer, okay? That, that may indeed be significant. What we know about this culture 
is that in the 1890s, local campesinos, local farmers, would be out uh, digging, you know, uh, preparing fields and things, and they would find archaeological sites, and they might find burial sites, and they would find these wonderful ceramic hollow figurines. And it's, it's because of, of those figurines which sort of captured the imagination of early explorers and collectors and such. Um, that that uh, attention became paid to West Mexico. It wasn't because of the architecture. The architecture that we saw is dirt and rock architecture that would have been covered with plastered adobe, but it didn't last. It's not like the stone architecture that you see at the Mayan and the Aztec sites that everybody can see just by walking by. I must be popular. Um, so, so what the Campesino showed and what the early explorers found is that these ceramic figures come from shaft tombs. And a shaft tomb is this. A shaft is dug into the earth and at the bottom there may be one tomb chamber, two tomb chambers, maybe even more. The depth of the shaft can be anywhere from two or three meters to a couple of them that are known to be more than 19 meters deep. That's a pretty deep shaft. And for the deep shafts, they tend to have more than one room. Now, here's a little bit about architecture. If you're walking along and you see a great mound of earth and stone, a pyramid, you'll look at that and say, isn't that spectacular? They must have been wonderful engineers. Look what they were able to build. Well, we call that above ground architecture. A shaft tomb is below ground architecture, negative architecture in a sense. If you took all the dirt and rock out of that and piled it in a pile, you too would say, these people were pretty good engineers. They were good planners, they were organized. They, they did an extraordinary uh, uh, amount of work uh, in this architecture. Okay, that's what we find. Here's one of the other interesting things about these shaft tombs. Not all of them, but some of them, the shaft actually comes up into the living floor of either a house or temple structure. So what's the significance of that? The interpretation that, that I think most of us are comfortable with in West Mexico is what we're talking, when we see this, we're talking about families, in this case elite families, and that there's communication between the family above and the family below. The family above is the living family in light. The family below are the ancestors in the tomb. And that this shaft essentially connects the world above and the world below. Um, this is the Huitzilapa tomb. I had the, uh, the privilege of actually doing the skeletal analysis on the six skeletons that came out of this tomb. It was, uh, again, an example of a, uh, the shaft coming out into the floor of a structure. It was about a nine meter shaft with two rooms at the bottom, three skeletons in each room, and uh, was one of the most spectacular shaft tombs ever found. Um, by archaeologists. Here's another little tidbit of information about West Mexico. About 99.9% .9 of the shaft tombs have all been looted. Not by archaeologists, but by folks who are digging them for objects to sell. Okay, so to find one that's pristine and this spectacular uh, was really very exciting. So I had the opportunity to, uh, to examine and analyze the skeletal material. While I was there, what I noticed, no great surprise, is gee, where you have female skeletons, you have these female figures, where you have male skeletons, these are male fig figures, so is there some relationship? Are these figures by chance representing the people who are deceased in the tomb? And if so, what part, what role might these figures actually play in, uh, uh, in this ritual? Well, this gets to the other point again about shaft tombs and using that as a term for the culture. Uh, what you will find in our exhibit and our publications is that uh, my colleagues and I really don't like to use the term shaft tomb culture. It puts way too much emphasis on one aspect of the mortuary behavior, on, on one aspect of the burial program, and it tends to exclude all the other spectacular thing these people have done. So your question is going to be, so now, Bob, what do you call that? And our answer is, 
We haven't figured that part out yet. We haven't found a good replacement for shaft tomb culture. Uh, but it, I will tell you, just from sort of the museum side of this, it makes it really hard to do an exhibit on a culture that you can't use a name for that people recognize. You know, if we said uh, 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 treasures of, uh, of uh, the Aztec Empire, if we said uh, Mayan kings and gods, you would, you would also have uh, at least a visual image, some concept of what we were talking about. West Mexico, ritual and identity. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, hopefully through the exhibit and the publications, we will, we will provide a little more of that information, but that's really one of the challenges of trying to do an exhibition on a culture that few people know about. Okay, what do we find as evidence below ground? Well, you're actually looking at a flooded multi-room tomb. Um, the, the shafts are deep and once the looters leave, they don't fill those back in. Why would you want to do that? That would be way too much work. So sadly, these tombs uh, get flooded during annual rain cycles. And one of my colleagues and a couple of his students uh, visited this one to map. This is looking at the ceiling of one of these chambers. And then, of course, uh, he's, they're in the tomb here looking into another chamber. These are pretty sophisticated pieces of engineering work. So we do find sometimes evidence below ground. If the archaeologist can get to a looted tomb before it's flooded, it's possible to do some, some mitigation, some salvage work to, to uh, collect and, and describe the things that are there that the looters may have missed or left behind. And that's some of where we get information uh, about how these tombs were used. Well, this is kind of the center point for the exhibit. West Mexico for many years has been recognized for these, um, what I consider to be extraordinary and elaborate uh, figures. Uh, they're fairly exotic. They're in different styles. Um, one of the other things, not only do my colleagues and I not like the term shaft tomb, but to call it a shaft tomb culture implies that it is one culture. When in fact we know that it's multiple cultures in the same region that share some of the same ideas, some of the same practices, uh, probably some of the same religious beliefs, but they're not exactly the same. You know, it would be like going to, to Europe in 1700. Uh, you, you have lots of cultures that share many common political and religious ideas, but they speak different languages and they show what they do in slightly different ways. We think that's kind of what's going on in West Mexico. Well, one of the things, one of the, the, the uh, goals of this exhibit, uh, and one of my goals as an anthropologist, is to help the public see these cultures and to see these people as real human beings. As much fun as these are, and I think these are terrific, um, these are fairly abstracted forms of humans. You know, obviously they're humanoid, they're, they're anthropomorphic figures, um, they're not crude, they're stylized, and they, they fit different sort of, uh, what do I want to say, uh, uh, directions of developing and highlighting uh, uh, their, their, their form and their clothing and, and body decoration, okay? But to ask a simple question, what would this figure look like if it was human? Well, Cheryl, who's sitting there in the middle, has an artistic background and, and uh, 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 had a nice computer program that was used to design clothing. And so she and another uh, student, a former student, uh, um, put together a large group of these drawings that are based on Gilcrease figures. So essentially, looking in great detail at these, um, reproducing the tattooing, the body painting, the personal adornment, the clothing on these as if they were real people. I, I think it totally changes the way you look at these figures. These look human, these are very abstracted. This male figure, 
you know, very interesting here. He's got a little conical hat. He's wearing what is almost a t-shirt like uh, upper garment uh, briefs to some extent. What's not clear because of 2000 years of patina and, and, and sort of covering is that his legs are actually painted and so are his arms. So this is a way to, to look at the figures and perhaps help see them the way that people would have seen them 2,000 years ago rather than the way we see them now with the interference of two millennia of patina. Okay? Well, once we start looking at the figures, we start recognizing that there are some figures that seem to share some very common characteristics, not just style in terms of how they're done, but what they're doing. Here's a good example. Here's a female male pair, and you'll notice that he's wearing a cape over one shoulder. So is he. Uh, he's got this sort of twisted turban hat, eh, sort of similar. Uh, interesting uh, ear appendages here, just like that. Do you see these two things that he's carrying in his hands? Can you identify those? It's a tortoise shell and an antler baton. It's a musical instrument, okay? Same thing. Now, this one is over 20 inches tall, seated. This one's about that tall. Now, if you wanted to, to give me your artistic opinion, your aesthetic opinion, we'd probably all agree, this is a better one. And this one's kind of crude. But they're the same character, or they're, they're wearing similar clothes, and they're play, playing the same instruments. So that must be some activity that was ritually very important. Well, 2,000 years ago, again, we don't have much... Well, we don't have any written records from these people. We don't know exactly what they were doing. But interestingly, if you look at this codex, and I won't attempt to pronounce that name, uh, this is a codex, uh, Aztec codex from the time of the conquest. What do we see here? Oh, isn't that interesting? Tortoise shell, antler baton. He does also uh, wear a cape over one shoulder. The legend of this particular character is that he sings at the death of kings. Now, some very striking physical and unusual similarities, but they're separated by 1,500 years and about 1,000 miles. Hmm. Is this a good analogy? Maybe. It's an analogy we can use to test but it it's sort of gets at there's something going on here. There's a, a complex of singing and ritual that may indeed be very deep in time and may have lasted a very long time. In the same way, we like to interpret archaeological evidence. And you saw this slide before. You saw this one before. Um, this really helps us when we do this. Think about what what kinds of activities went on here? What did people do? What are the connections? Are these houses? Are these temples? Um, why are there all of these rings? Uh, is it possible, for example, that one ring represents one lineage or one clan? Well, that's possible. When you have multiple rings, does that mean there are essentially multiple families that are living together, multiple clans that are living together? Or is it simply when this ring gets filled up, then you build another ring and move over there or have everybody move over there. And then when that gets filled up, you, you create more rings so that, so that a small village becomes a large city sort of by, by increment and by uh, accretion. We don't know the answer to that, but that's, that's one of the directions that research will go. We look at these figures, and again, based on what, uh, what Cheryl and Aubrey were able to do, uh, we have some very striking representations based on some of our figures. Uh, this figure sits atop the Volador figure the flying man figure that's in the exhibit. And if you look closely at him, you will see the representations in clay of a feathered headdress, of a feathered uh, uh, cape on his back and, and uh, armed feathers, and probably feathered fans that he's carrying in his hands. So again, it's looking at what we see at these ceramic figures and asking the question, what do those things represent? 
um, other than just looking at, at the figure and say, well, this is of style A or style B, it's a male, it's a female. That's all well and good, but that's not very useful, to be honest. Well, there are other activities, and this is where I think West Mexico is very, very unusual. Uh, West Mexico, 2,000 years ago, people were creating in pottery uh, ceramic scenes and tableaus. Okay, this is a representation of the Mesoamerican ball game. Again, you get the Mesoamerican ball game uh, among the Maya, among the Aztec. Uh, it was played at, at uh, uh, Tenochtitlan. Ball game courts have been found as far north as southern Arizona. So the Mesoamerican ball game lasted for a long time and over a, a huge piece of geography. It wasn't always played in the same way it evolved, and if you think about that, it only makes sense. Any game that existed over 1,500 years, you would expect some change through time, okay? And we see that. This is the West Mexican form. What's interesting is the, among other things, is the architecture. Uh, the ball court itself is right down the middle here with raised sides for the spectators. What's sort of interesting is you look at these spectators and they have their arms around each other, they're looking in different directions, they're talking to each other. Does this look like a religious event? Does this look like a religious ceremony? This is a social event. This is an activity. The ball game indeed was ritual, but it was also sport. And this is a good example of that. And then you have these, these uh, houses or temple-like structures on the end uh, where people were sitting, and presumably this is where the elites were sitting, or perhaps uh, some of the religious uh, figures. And then here were the people watching the game. Well, in addition to the anthropomorphic figures, West Mexico is well known for Oyas, which is what this form is called, an Oya, O-L-L-A, uh, and particularly these polished red Oyas, um, represent fruit. In some cases, you can see here, this is actually a platter or basket with fruit in it, right here. So essentially, it's, it's as if you were bringing someone a bowl of fruit, although this is in ceramic. The other thing to note, of course, is that it's an olla, it's a hollow vessel. One of the things that we have done, started to do uh, for this exhibit is to look at the, the evidence of residues inside the pots. Well, what liquids, what foods, what other things might have been inside those pots? You know, sort of intuitively, one of the things I would think is, well, if, if these are fruits, is it possible that uh, there were fermented beverages of that fruit in the pots? Well, that makes logical sense, but we probably ought to test it out and see if there's any evidence. That would be a good thing. Um, we have done that. Uh, not so much with fruit, but I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, in a couple of vessels, we did some residue testing and we found evidence of a powerful hallucinogenic drug. Okay, kind of interesting. We also see, and uh, this is uh, one of the Martinez uh, uh, paintings from the exhibit, is this idea of, of offerings, of carrying bowls of fruit. Goes back a very long time, but if you were traveling in Mexico in the uh, uh, early part of the 20th century up to World War II, you might still, people, still see people, particularly women, carrying these bowls of fruit on their heads, on their, on their hands. So, so this imagery, uh, goes back a long time. The reverse of that is, and we will talk about that in the exhibit as well, is uh, clearly archaeological material from West, Mex from West Mexico and other parts of Mexico has inspired generations of artists, which is kind of fun. And Martinez was, was no exception to that. Now, whenever we talk about antiquities, we have to talk about authenticity. The twin evils of archaeology are looting and fakery. And in West Mexico, you have a great deal of both. So as a curator, one of the first questions is, what is this thing I'm looking at? Is it genuine? Is it fake? Or even worse, is it something in between? 
uh, as a student and, and uh, later on I actually had the opportunity to sit down and do some oral history with a couple of families that make modern replicas of ancient figures for a living. We don't call them fakers, we call them fabricators. It's a little more polite. Um, but it was really interesting. Uh, one family that lived in Ahihik, right outside of uh, Guadalajara on Lake Chapala, um, had quite a lab going. And one time when I was there, they were getting ready to send 400 hollow figurines to Europe. And uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the owner, or the, the, uh, the, the, the grand man of the house, Rodolfo, assured me that he never sold his figures as anything but what they were, modern replicas. And I believe that he did that. However, I also believe that the people he sold them to somehow did not have the same ethical bias that he did. And somewhere across the Atlantic, these large figures were transformed into ancient figures for a whole lot more money. And that has been one of the problems in West Mexico. One of the first things that uh, I was able to do when, when I came here, and by the way, I will tell you that I was very surprised to find that Thomas Gilcrease, bless his heart, back between about 1948 and 1955, acquired about 400 of these ceramic figures uh, for the collection. And what you are seeing in the exhibit is the largest presentation of the Gilcrease West Mexican collection that has ever been put on display. Now, we don't have 400 pieces in there. We have over 200 pieces, um, and certainly, uh, I would say, the best pieces. So it's a, it's a great representation of what Thomas collected. Well, one of the first things I was interested in is, are they real or are they not? And thanks to a medical doctor friend of mine many years ago, uh, we had access to a medical endoscope. Some of you may know what that's used for in other contexts. Okay, well, we use it to look inside these figures and it helps really uh, show on the inside whether a figure is complete, whether it's been broken and repaired, whether it has the indicators of authenticity or that it indicates that it may be fake. So we, we use that to sort of uh, code, if you will, all of the figures in, in the Gilcrease West Mexican collection um, to, to so we know what we're working with, and then how reliable are these pieces for the type of research that we're doing, okay? Well, in addition to, uh, to lots of plants and human figures, there's a huge variety of, of animal figures. There are, there are birds, there are serpents. Um, you will see this pot on display, and I, I will tell you that I probably looked at it a half a dozen times before Cheryl kindly pointed out that this is not just a coil, this is a serpent coiled around this pot. Okay, a, a, a very sort of elegant design. Uh, as you will see upstairs, there are lots of images of dogs. Well, how do we interpret these, these animals, these birds? Uh, there are crabs, there are shrimp, there are deer, there are all kinds of animals. There are coatimundis and even rodents that are depicted. What do those mean? If we think that the vessels that show plants represent food, then what do we think the animals represent? Are they food? Are they ritual animals? Are they, are they spirit guides? Are they totems for clans? We don't know the answer to most of those. We do know for the dogs there are two reasonable and not necessarily mutually exclusive explanations. The, the wonderful little fat round polished dogs that you see up in the exhibit, those are food dogs. People ate them, okay? So that's the practical part of that. What's the other part? Well, the dog is, is associated with Shalotl, the earth monster, who accompanies his brother Quetzalcoatl through the underworld to reemerge in the morning. So you have, you have dogs associated with food, you have dogs associated as guides through the underworld, and thereby probably associated uh, as guides with the deceased in the tombs. Okay, so we, we think we know, or at least we have two good, two good uh, possibilities here of what the dogs mean. But parrots, 
snakes. Uh, serpents certainly are common in iconography all over West Mexico, and sometimes they have a positive connotation, sometimes they don't. Parrots, certainly parrot feathers, the, the blue-green uh, feathers of parrots and macaws uh, have a very important uh, ritual symbolism. In fact, uh, they are still used today uh, in the pueblos of the southwest and in some parts of Mesoamerica as well. So they still have ritual power. And perhaps that's the reason we find so many parrot figures. Well, one of the fun parts of what we do of what I get to do sometimes, is to do different types of analysis on these figures. And this is a figure, well, all three of these are figures from the, the Gilcrease collection. And uh, we had endoscoped them to see what was on the inside. And we came to two different conclusions. Uh, this one, I will tell you, has some repair on it. The, it has a human face mask. You'll see it in the exhibit. And that face mask is a total replacement in modern times. It is a sophisticated deception from at least 1955 or earlier. That's a scary thing. It's a really good fake. And Thomas Gilcrease paid a lot of money for it as a genuine piece. Okay, uh, These two figures, which are also on display, they're a little over 30 inches tall. We call those monumentals because they are. Um, and I probably don't know of another five or six in the United States anywhere. And we have two here that are spectacular. So we cat endoscoped and cat scanned them. Absolutely genuine. Now. There's some repair work on them. There are some internal firing cracks. If any of you are potters, you know to, to, to create a ceramic figure 30 inches tall without any, any uh, blemishes is kind of, kind of difficult, okay? These are masterworks as far as I'm concerned. They're just spectacular. So we, we, we use CT, uh, and in this case, it allowed us to uh, look at the cross section, to look at the clay, to see where the repairs were. Uh, we did it uh, from front to back and from side to side. And then the, the CT scanner can automatically compile these into a 3D image, which is what we have here. This is a very useful tool. And one of the things that I have found over the years is there are a lot of really bored medical doctors out there. And if you take them an interesting opportunity, uh, very often they will say, yeah, let's do that. And so we've gotten all of our, all of the requests we've made uh, to have these cats scanned. Um, and it's, it's really a great tool and tells us more than we knew before we set out in this. Residue analysis. Okay, uh, basically there are two ways to, to extract residue from the inside of these vessels. One is a, a dry method and one is a wet method. The dry method is you scrape some of the uh, material from the inside of the pot um, and, and uh, essentially you're doing a, um, uh, uh, an elemental analysis of what's in that residue. Uh, here these gentlemen are doing what's called uh, sonification where they use um, uh, water, not just tap water, but uh, uh, Distilled. yeah, that, um, and, uh, and sort of swirl it around for a specified amount of time and then take that water residue and analyze what, what is in there. Uh, the challenge of this is, yeah, we can create these samples, that's, that's easy. The hard part is what do you compare uh, the chemical residue with. You kind of need to know what you're looking for in order to know if you found it. Does that make sense? Because it's, it's kind of like DNA. You can have your DNA uh, uh, taken, that's easy. But if, if you were trying to see, well, am I in this family or that family, you have to have a comparative element part of that. Well, residue analysis is kind of the same thing in that regard. Here's, here's our prime example right now. We submitted a number of vessels from West Mexico and also from the American Southeast uh, for residue analysis. About five of the vessels from West Mexico came back with residue of Datura. 
Uh, we know it in this country as Jimson weed or loco weed. Uh, it's a powerful hallucinogenic that can be deadly. Um, the vessels we found it in, this is probably a drinking vessel, but we also had a vessel that's uh, in, uh, in Spanish is called a mocajete or chili grinder. It's a little tripod bowl with cross hatching on the inside, and this is how you would grind spices. Well, in the case of our mocajete, they, they, were, they were processing datura. So we have a vessel that's for the processing of datura, and then another vessel that's uh, involved in the actual drinking of that, of that material. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first time this has been identified in, in West Mexico. So we're very excited about that. And uh, in the future, in the next couple of years, we hope to do more testing, not only on Datura, uh, but on other types of material. Well, so we've, we've talked about West Mexico a little bit. We've talked a little bit about how science is used to, to explore the past, to give us some insights into the past. But we would be remiss if we also didn't acknowledge that antiquities often inspire contemporary artists. It's been true for a very long time. This is a photo, oops. This is a photograph in the exhibit uh, taken by Florence Arkeen uh, back in uh, probably the 1930s, I think. And this is Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo on their balcony. And if you look through this window, you will see a large number of uh, West Mexican ceramic figures. Uh, here's a West Mexican figure in one of Frida Kahlo's uh, paintings. And also, of course, the Mexican Esquintli. Uh, this is the modern version uh, of, of the dog that you saw those little little fat round red dogs uh, from 2,000 years ago. Okay, so the point is uh, that these these ancient images, these ancient figures, continue to have power. They continue to inspire people, uh, and every new generation comes up with their own way to use them. Um, if you saw those four tires up there, hopefully you saw that there's an engraved image of a Quetzalcoatl, a feathered serpent in these tires. And then in the, the Michael Manchaca uh, video, he's, he's using ancient images, obviously in a totally new way, but it, it really resonates to have these, these great early images. Well, antiquities also sometimes get, uh, get taken over for different uses. Um, certainly those of you who are of the generation who remember these from the 1970s, 1980s, the Kahlua ads were everywhere. Um, this is one that's sort of fun. Uh, it has a quote by Vincent Price. Vincent Price, who you all remember as a, uh, an actor of uh, either great or horrible movies, whichever you prefer. Uh, I thought they were terrific. Um, he also, in his private life, was a major collector of tribal art, African, Oceanic, and, and uh, American Indian art. Um, so it's uh, not surprising that, uh, that he has this little bit. Well, here we are. So Cheryl and I and others in the, uh, in the museum, and I will have to say for an exhibit this complex and large, everybody in the museum has their fingerprint somewhere on this exhibit. I'll guarantee you that. Um, we've been working at it uh, pretty hardcore for the last three years. In addition to the exhibition, um, we have a more scholarly volume. This has 14 articles by scholars from about five different countries. And hopefully this volume sort of sets the standard of what we know about West Mexico today. This is the catalog for the exhibit that pictures everything in the exhibit, every single object that's in the exhibit. So uh, with that, I will close and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And then in a little bit, we'll go over to the gift shop and I'll sign books if you like that. So thank you. Yes. From the things that uh, remain to be discovered, we did not know. What among those intrigue you most? What would you most like to know that remains to be discovered by these people? Good question. And the answer is everything. Um, Chris Beekman, my colleague from Denver, one of his particular directions is to simply do a systematic survey of where are the sites. Where did people live? If we look only at the shaft tomb sites, we get a very skewed view 
of where people were living. We, get it, we don't get any sense of how broadly over the landscape they live. We don't get a sense of were there lots of these Guachimontone large sites or did really most of the population live in little tiny farming hamlets? So that would be one. The other would be to actually have a systematic excavation or testing of a living site to see what actually went on there. Um, that, would, that would be one of the directions for my type of work, I mean, um, I, I don't get to go to the field very much anymore. I'm, I'm, I pretty much work with museum collections. Um, Cheryl and I have developed a, an examination protocol of about 74 variables, both inside and outside the vessel. And we now have about 1,500 figures in our database. Now that the exhibit is up and the books are done, our goal would be over the next couple of years to get this sample up over 5,000, which means going to other museums around the US and possibly in Mexico to record information on the collections that already exist. You know, one of the, the messages that I think is important about this kind of exhibit is, you know, everybody knows, or at least the truism is, oh, you've got all that stuff in the basement, nobody ever gets to see it. Sadly, that's true, particularly with archaeological material. I'm a firm believer, though, that for each generation of scientists and curators that come along, when you ask new questions, when you use new techniques, old collections become more valuable as time goes on. So my goal is not necessarily to go discover new things in the field. My goal is to discover new information in the collections that we already know about. Decide who are genuine and how many are sort of fake. Um, interesting, there are virtually no fakes. There are some that have small repairs. There are some that have replacements. There are some that are significantly uh, repaired and have replacement. The, the, the killer is this uh, Colima dog with the human face mask. The dog part is common. The face mask part, extremely rare, and that's the part that's fake. So that was, uh, that was kind of a disappointment. Now, I've looked in some other collections, and I will tell you, other museum collections, which will go unnamed, uh, have a higher percentage of pieces that I would consider to be dubious or bogus. And I will also say that that's often true when the collections were acquired after about 1965 or 70. Uh, in, the, in the late 60s and early 70s, and some of you may remember Don Juan and the Yaqui Way of Knowledge and you know, all that sort of stuff. Well, uh, among the other things that that sparked was a real spike in both looting and faking. And so my observation is that, that museum collections that started in that era are more likely to have uh, dubious pieces in them. The two oldest collections that I know about in the U.S. are at the Field Museum in Chicago and the American Museum in, in uh, uh, New York, the American Museum of Natural History. They have collections that go back to the 1890s. But that doesn't mean there aren't any fakes in them. Um, but that's another story. Yes? Uh, many of the items in the exhibit are from other yes. places. And so how long did it take how long did it take us to put this together? Cheryl and I have been working on this pretty much nonstop for three years. Yeah, it's a, it's a complex exhibit. Um, yes, there are, there are a fair number of pieces from other collections, but for the, for the antiquities, really most of them come from the Gilcrease collection. There were a couple of others that we just didn't have, uh, and we were uh, fortunate to be able to borrow those from other folks. There was a question, yes? There was a, a vessel uh, unadorned, and it was labeled a yoke. Yes. That me. It should. Um, what he's asking about is there's a there's a U-shaped vessel, a ceramic vessel up on display back in the corner. The yoke is associated more with the ball game and with the Maya. The Maya 
wore these great stone yokes. In fact, up until we did a little renovation, there was a stone yoke Mayan yoke on display here at the Gilcrease. So when I saw that, it's, it stands out. It doesn't make any sense that it should be from West Mexico, or you have to say, gee, this ball game ritual and regalia has much more time depth than we knew, and it wasn't just Mayan. So that's a, a piece that deserves, I think, considerably more study because it, it just, it's bizarre. And, and it seems like a utilitarian kind of, kind of piece. Uh, it, like I said, it, it wasn't embellished. Uh, and it, with the small hole on it, it looked, it looked like it, it had some depth. You, it doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Which, by the way, is why we do this stuff. We want to try to make sense out of it if we can. Yes. Um, oh, um, I know you, uh, I understand uh, going to uh, or, or confining your current work to um, museum collections. It's a very valuable thing to do. But have, are there any of your colleagues who are using uh, aerial uh, and um, Photography to that is outer space stuff to to locate um, uh, areas of habitation in West Mexico to pursue this uh, discovery of us. That that's really one of the new hot topics in archaeology um, that is being done in many many parts of the world. Um, you know, even 20 years ago when I was uh, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, I had a colleague who was a paleontologist who studied the earliest primates in North America, fossil primates in North America. And he was using satellite photographs to identify the geological strata in which those specimens were most likely to occur. So he was using uh, NASA uh, photography to limit, or uh, limit's not the right term, to focus where he was looking on the on the ground. So yes, that's there are, are archaeologists all over the world now who are really starting to use that that technology and to great effect. The downside of that is sometimes so do the looters. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And of course it would be very difficult to, uh, I mean you might locate uh, 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 since some of these sites could be under uh, current uh, habitation sites or cities or small villages and and you wouldn't i mean finding a shaft tomb would be i mean you wouldn't even pursue satellite photography for that i'm not for sure that's true i i think that's going to be interesting to see who of our our colleagues in mexico or the u.s use that technology and will prove us all wrong when we say 99.9 .9 percent of the shaft tombs have already been looted it's it's a possibility yes um, I haven't seen the exhibit yet, so I'm not as familiar with it. Are the figurines, what are they portraying? Are there different categories that, that they are configured in? Or? Um. No, uh, <laughs> there there are there are at least a half a dozen or so recognized style of human figures. Uh, there are male figures. There are female figures. Uh, there are images of old people. There are images of younger people. There are images of people with uh, p uh, pathologies. There are images of plants. There are images of am animals. And then there are these incredible tableaus that show scenes of activity. So it's, a, it's very rich. We were also very fortunate to borrow three Han Dynasty Chinese mortuary figures, a, a temple, a warrior, and a dog. Now, I'm not suggesting that Han Dynasty China and West Mexico were connected in any way. It's just in both places at the same time, they created tombs for the elites of their society and they, they interred or entombed these ceramic figures as part of the offerings for the dead. So we wanted to show those. So, but West Mexico, Han Dynasty China, and Egypt are really about the only three ancient cultures that I'm aware of that produce these scenes that have survived to the modern time. One last question, yes. So 
were most of these figurines found in the tombs? That is a much more interesting question than we would have uh, thought a couple of years ago. Again, my uh, colleague in Denver, uh, Chris Beekman, has been doing excavation in living sites and finding fragments and fragmentary figurines in the living sites. As part of the analysis that Cheryl and I have been doing, we are finding use wear on some of the vessels and some of the figurines. Well, if you're making something to go into the tomb, there's no use wear. It's, it's pristine. It goes into the tomb. What the use wear suggests is that these objects, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, were used in rituals and activities above ground before they went into the tomb. So just as the tomb is the final resting place for the people, it's the final resting place for some of these figures, but they had a life before. And, and that was, we didn't know that a few years ago. It was assumed that all of this stuff came from tombs. And it's probably not true. So, thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the exhibit. And for some of you, I'll see you in the gift shop.